As everybody's making their way back, I just want to share a couple thoughts after that first panel. Uh, a couple. Yeah, you know, one thing I thought it was interesting to have uh, a company like General Dynamics saying they could potentially be sending people to Cumberland for training. I mean, that, that's the kind of thing that uh, that is just just transformational. Uh, it's not just a, a small marginal progress. It has just uh, really uh, scalable potential. Um, and then I think the, the conversation, we didn't get to dive too far into it outside of general dynamics, but this idea that a lot of these opportunities are not just jobs, they are career opportunities. They, there are people that have come out of these hubs and out of these programs that are making six figures, that are in management positions. Um, and uh, it's, it's really a, a, a career ladder that you get on, you gain the experience, and then you start working the companies. Um, and the different opportunities and, and can work your way up. So it's a great opportunity as it relates to that. I'll say um, uh, uh, one other thing is that these skill sets are critically important to what we see as kind of the next step in our blueprint is around small business in the digital economy. This, this idea that as an entrepreneur, as an organization, how does this change my company's marketable opportunities when we are uh, connected. And so that's what we're gonna talk about next. We're gonna transition from individuals who are working remotely. And so we kind of got this vision as they build these skill sets that we have innovation centers there. Maybe they're working for companies and they have an idea that says, you know, I could do this better or uh, I have a, an app I, idea that I could solve this problem with. Um, or maybe they get together with a few of their friends and say, hey, we could start our own company. And it starts to build this synergy in the digital economy where we really start to make significant progress is when we see companies locally starting up within this framework and building and scaling. Um, so we had intended to have uh, on our panel uh, two brothers that started a company up outside of Moorhead, and I'll let uh, Ryan kind of tell the story. They couldn't be here today. Uh, ended up, they were getting a, a business award from their local chamber there and ended up scheduling it at the same time. So they picked the right place to be. We weren't giving them an award, <laughs> uh, but we were going to thank them and give them barbecue. Um, but I, Ryan's team, and I'll introduce each of our panelists here, and Ryan's team's been working with them and our team at SOAR, um, but we have uh, Ryan Jones, who's going to sit in for the New Frontier Outfitters. Uh, their website is madeforthejourney.com, uh, and you can go check that out. Uh, and then we have Tim Hughes, who's with the Kentucky Department of Agriculture, um, and we are so thankful to have him here. What we want to give you on this panel is a snapshot of small business, uh, from an e-commerce standpoint, small business from a service standpoint. And then we're going to, Tim's going to talk about agriculture and how connectivity is actually transforming and disrupting ag uh, and how we can leverage it. Uh, and then we've got Peyton May, who's the COO of BitSource, started there in a creative capacity, but they are a software development company um, and a service company based out of Pikeville. And then we have Jamie Couch. I think it says Chris Self on the agenda. And we switched him out. Chris is here. We appreciate him, but Jamie's going to speak on behalf. He's really been the project manager for their telehealth efforts. He's the AVP of administration at Advent Health in Manchester. Uh, so from a healthcare perspective, how do you leverage connectivity uh, uh, in the healthcare sector? So let's start with Ryan. Um, same format. We're, I'm going to give them five minutes each to kind of share um, share their perspective, and then we'll take questions at the end. And Ryan Jones, I didn't introduce him, he is a uh, SOAR employee, uh, Director of Business and Innovation. So if you would imagine looking at our blueprint, he is really focused on helping us implement goal three of the blueprint and working with stakeholders across the region. He has several employees that uh, work in his department. This is a partnership with the Kentucky Innovation Office at the Cabinet for Economic Development. Um, and so we have business and innovation champions, and maybe you want to introduce those maybe when we yeah. get started that, that are working yeah. on that team deployed across the region, driving uh, entrepreneurial ecosystem and trying to shift the culture of Appalachia to create more startups and help the ones that are here scale up. Uh, so Ryan Jones is our Director of Business Innovation. Thank you, Jared. Uh, if you want to 
flip to oh, the yeah. next slide. And we do have our, like you said, uh, we do have our business and innovation champions um, here today. We have Jeffrey Justice, which is up here in front, taking some photos for us. Colby Fugit over there, uh, and then Brittany Branham right beside of Colby. Anybody basically with the light bulb shirt on is Soar Innovation. So. Uh, we're glad to be here and glad to be on this panel, uh, sitting in for New Frontier. Um, like Jared said, they are accepting a small business award for the Chamber of Commerce, so they are sorry that they cannot be here. Um, but these guys have an incredible story um, and just wanted to share a little bit about their story. Um, and Jared said, it's made for the journey .com. Uh, These guys are two brothers from Moorhead, Kentucky, uh, that started an Appalachian inspired apparel brand. Um, and just a brief story when they first started, uh, Josh Ravenscraft and Jared Ravenscraft is the brothers. Josh is still in college at MSU, and uh, Jared's actually graduated now. But uh, they basically started with a laptop uh, in their mom's kitchen to start this brand. Uh, Jared was more of the creative side of the company and Josh was more of the go-getter uh, and more of the salesman for the company. Um, but they built a website, they signed up on Facebook, they signed up on Instagram, and essentially just started building content around Appalachia. The beauty of Appalachia, uh, the outdoors of Appalachia, the people, and the journey. Uh, and primarily their brand is around journey on. Um, and that's what they have built their entire brand on, brand on is adventure, outdoors adventure, get outside, take a hike, as you can see is one of their uh, newest releases uh, from their, I guess their summer, summer release. Um, but they built a large regional following and they did that by selling trucker hats out of their Jeep, uh, just traveling around uh, and kind of trying to figure out how they could get their products online, but first they just sort of built a regional brand. Uh, and now they sell 95% uh, of all of their products on their website. And this would not be possible at all if they did not have connectivity. Um, they sell nationwide, they also sell globally. Uh, they travel around all over the place now and uh, are building a cult following in these mountain towns. Uh, recently, they were traveling in Denver, Colorado, and somehow has built a huge following in Colorado. So uh, now they're looking at their data analytics where people are purchasing from uh, on their website, and they're looking at adding on locations um, in those towns that are uh, purchasing more of their products. Um, they're looking to expand and have the ability to compete with companies like North Face and Patagonia and Columbia. Uh, they have five employees now. Um, and this would, like I said, this would just would not be possible if they did not have uh, the connectivity. Um, and there are individuals and companies like this all over Eastern Kentucky and we're identifying them and we're trying to figure out how we can help them leverage technology to help them scale their business just like these guys uh, made for the journey and New Frontier. Uh, and we're lucky enough that we have a uh, technology development company like BitSource to be able to go in, uh, sit down with us and these companies and uh, figure out what their needs are. We identify their challenges uh, and we go in, We first we look at their, uh, their Google, uh, Google Google footprint, how do you get found on Google? Um, we look at their website, do you have a website? If you do have a website, how much track are you getting to it? How can we market your website better? Uh, and using people like New Frontier as a way to inspire other individuals and companies um, as well. But uh, we have to have the ability to export uh, if we are not exporting, whether it's code, whether it's, um, whether it's services or products, uh, we have to have the ability to export to be able to survive here in Eastern Kentucky, and we can do that by leveraging technology um, to do so. Um, so with that, I will turn it over to you, Jared. That's great. Um, so that's a quick snapshot of, uh, of you know, a small company with tremendous potential. I mean, you can either look at this and say, oh, two guys started a company, have five employees. Or you can look at it like our team kind of looks like, wait, they could probably have 10. They could have 20. They've done two towns. And that's the way they're thinking. Uh, and so how do you leverage? And what our team is trying to do is identify companies like this that when we met with them were on an island as it relates to the technical assistance providers. They didn't know about SBDC. They didn't know about the, the MACES, the SCEDs, the Center for Rural Development. They're just out there trying to run a company. 
And so we have boots on the ground that are going in their door and saying, hey, what do you need? What's the barrier? And then we're referring them to all these resource partners that already exist in the region. And uh, the title of the staff is champion. That's, they're fighting for them. They're pushing through. They're supporting their efforts, whether it's workforce, finance, whatever they need. Um, so we've been online with this program and staff for uh, – four months, five months, yep. and we've had over 200 client interactions, yep. and we have 100 and what's, referrals, open referrals. 157, currently. 157 referrals we made to our different resource partners within the region. Um, and so our team's located strategically across the region. We've got somebody in Corbin, somebody in Hazard, um, somebody in Paintsville, Pikeville, and then we'll have somebody covering Moorhead, Ashland area. So, got a team out there. If you need help, got a flyer over there, packets. They're here. Find them. If you got companies, um, we can just we're, we're going to move them through the process and help them grow. Um, so, the next uh, company, actually, we got Tim sitting next. PowerPoint's got bit sources uh, slides next. So, we'll uh, we'll move on to Peyton May, uh, Chief Operating Officer of BitSource. provides digital services as well. Um, we're really a testament to what it looks like to work alongside EKSOP and SOAR. Um, BitSource was founded uh, from an idea that was generated from a SOAR fact-finding mission early on. Um, we're now in our fifth year, and we've continued to work with EKSOP to offer training opportunities to our employees and software development as well. Um, this next slide, in order to just kind of like, it's overwhelming in a way how dependent we are on, on software, especially in a technology company. And if your work involves any, you know, anything on a computer today, then you're aware of how dependent you are on software. So these are just some of the technologies that we use on a daily basis, and there are plenty more. And um, you know, these cover everything from um, recruitment and, and training to uh, cloud services, how we host our solutions on various platforms um, for customers, how we communicate with them, how we do development, how we do design. So our company is totally dependent on broadband and solutions that are provided over the web. Um, again, these are platforms and services. Um, as Ryan mentioned, you know, we're currently working with the SOAR Innovation team on how we can provide services locally in our region. And um, there's sort of a difference, I guess, in developing a custom software solution and then taking advantage of systems that already exist. Today, there are a ton of resources available. Um, and in most cases, locally, we can leverage things that already exist that are uh, a lot more reasonably priced to help a company scale. Um, so that's what uh, we're really focused on locally. And then um, uh, around the nation, um, we're trying to define our niche, which is really leveraging on the industrial and manufacturing um, type work that our employees have spent the majority of their careers in. This really informs um, the, their software development abilities um, in a practical sense when we're working for companies that have manufacturing processes um, or workflows that are similar. Um, I'm going to briefly tell you about um, two products that we've developed internally. So that's the other side um, beyond providing service, digital services to companies to help them scale. We also do our own internal uh, product development. Um, OD Save is a uh, Narcan response app that's meant to um, help a you know victim of an overdose get access to Narcan. There are probably eight or ten solutions that are that are just like the solution that we've built, and this has been an ongoing process for you know the past two to three years, and was actually um, birthed at a SOAR MIT hackathon. Uh, and one thing I want to impress upon like the technology sector is. Um, it's, it's an interesting that there are 10 of these products out there. There's even one that's open source, but there's not really anyone that's prevailing in the marketplace right now. So we can have an idea here um, that's just like an idea in any other major city around the country, but really what the most critical piece of it is like getting to market and be able to deploy it, uh, accumulate users, and then create continuous value to build something that uh, helps customers. Um, this next product is called 
Lend a Hand. Uh, it's a, an app that's supposed to help students in schools uh, take preventative measures to prevent uh, bullying or to be able to um, report if there is a weapon or a drugs on campus that collect or connects to the admins in the school as well as like the local police department. Um, there was another app launched recently, much like OD Save, you know, there are several apps like this on the marketplace as well. So one in North Carolina that came online in December 2018, and they're already in 5,100 schools. They've probably captured 5% of the market, uh, but still, you know, there's opportunity there. Um, so this is just a testament to kind of like the creativity that exists within our region, how we can solve problems that aren't only local, but are national and global. And then really the challenge is how do we take those products to market, scale them and build, build companies around them. So that's a, a brief little view of BizSource. Yeah, that's, that's uh, great content there. Thinking about how do we solve global problems? How do we get our students thinking not just about local problems, but many times the local problem solution has applications across uh, the country and with connectivity it makes deploying something like an app or uh, it makes it totally possible and feasible and that's a bit of a mind uh, set shift uh, but the reality is the next generation of Appalachian Kentuckys are going to be doing that work and they're going to be engaged in it somewhere or they're either going to leave and be engaged in it or we're going to deliver them the opportunity to stay here and be engaged in it and so we're trying to nurture that and build on it uh, let's move on to the the, the ag sector and let uh, Tim Hughes kind of share uh, from the Kentucky Department of Agriculture's uh, perspective on connectivity and agriculture. Just received a message from Bessie. She's happy in the back corner of the farm. Just got another message from Bessie. Uh, she's being chased by a coyote. <laughs> The bell has been a useful form of communication in rural communities and in our country for a long time. Uh, on the farm, it could have been used to alert uh, the workers that lunch is ready or dinner, as it was called back then. Uh, maybe the barn was on fire or uh, we're getting ready for some type of a big community event. Technology has changed considerably. I was given a gift. The USDA uh, recently published a report, a case for rural broadband, and it was actually published in April of this year. And so uh, this is a topic that I'm not directly involved with, but they put together a tremendous report uh, talking about the agricultural applications of broadband and technology. Fifteen years ago, I was farming full-time in southern Kentucky, primarily grain and beef cattle operation. And at that time, we were just starting to utilize uh, GPS technology. Uh, now, tractors can be auto-steer. Uh, they can be operated remotely. And so the first slide is talking about row crop agriculture. And I didn't see a lot of large corn and soybean farms as I was driving uh, from Frankfurt this morning. But in Kentucky, uh, we have farms throughout the state that are utilizing lots of interconnectivity and in technology. Even when I was still farming, I had the opportunity to go to Nebraska and tour one of the combine facilities. And at that time, they were putting sensors in the combine that would self-diagnose engine problems, technology problems within the machine that would alert the local distributor that, hey, this filter is going bad or this bearing is uh, about to play out. And so the company could have that part in stock and then alert a technician that, hey, you're going to get a call from Farmer Jones that he needs his tractor repaired before the farmer even knows he's got a problem. That technology has advanced so rapidly over the last few years. It's looking at basically three different concepts of the planning, the production, and the market coordination. Uh, the planning, uh, doing soil analysis and sending that off to a laboratory anywhere in the world that can provide the farmer the crop recommendations on what needs to be done in that place. Uh, the production, those combines that I mentioned have sensors. As the combine is going across the field, it will tell the farmer individual spots on the, the property which is yielding best, where there's crop problems and things like that. 
And then finally, market coordination. We're in a global marketplace and our products are shipped all over the world. Kentucky agriculture is about a 5.6, $5.7 billion industry. And in a given year, we may export somewhere around a third of the crops and the products that we grow here in the state internationally. An area that's probably a little closer to here would be specialty crops. And I know there's been a lot of talk about large greenhouse operations in the state. And there's a project that's moving forward in Moorhead, Kentucky, that'll be 60 acres under roof, about a 60 or $70 million investment. The company that's doing that is using a uh, technology from the Netherlands. They can put sensors in that facility and you would have technicians anywhere in the world that can diagnose water quality issues, temperature, any aspect of managing that operation anywhere in the world. Another one is going in in Stanford and that one is using Israeli technology. We're in a global society and this interconnectivity of having broadband is truly important anywhere in the world. The third one is livestock. I mentioned Bessie a while ago. <laughs> I always wanted an excuse to throw a paper airplane in school and not get in trouble. <laughs> drone technology. We can now send I'm going to put you in the out. corner. <laughs> Stand in the corner for two minutes. <laughs> Don't tell my boss, okay? <laughs> uh, drone technology is amazing, whether it's uh, agriculture, forestry. Uh, instead of having to rely on the bell, uh, Bessie now has a sensor that tells her body temperature. Uh, we can have calculations to determine whether she's in heat, whether she's bred, whether she has mastitis, if she's a dairy cow. Uh, if it's forestry, uh, we can cruise the 700-acre uh, track of land, determine what species of trees are there, not have to worry about the rattlesnakes or the copperheads. Uh, we can control the equipment uh, if we've got steep slopes. It's just, it's amazing the technology that's out there. And then the, uh, the market opportunities, the market coordination. Uh, we're talking local foods, and I think that's something that's a high priority for SOAR in this area of the state. Just-in-time delivery is so important for restaurants, food service, manufacturers, and so better communication between the farmer, what the stage of the products, the crops, and things like that, and then the needs of the end user. Uh, we work with a number of schools around the state that want to source locally grown vegetables, fresh vegetables for their students. If a farmer has a surplus of those products and they're getting close to being ripe and can't be shipped a long distance, that's something that that local school could possibly incorporate into their menu for that day if you've got a willing food service provider. And so communication between the farmer and the one that's planting the meals and coordinating that can take advantage of some distressed crops and, and products. We're doing a series of meetings around the state called LAND, Linking Agriculture for Networking and Development. So uh, Commissioner Quarles will be back down here on June the 18th. Uh, we're meeting at the Kentucky River Area Development District. Uh, we're doing six others in other parts of the state. But what we're doing is trying to further connect agriculture, economic development, and manufacturing. And so we're gonna be highlighting some successes that are applicable to this region of the state. Uh, we've got a company out of Barberville, Smartwood, that uh, built a facility about three years ago that's using beach lumber and they're producing popsicle sticks. Uh, we've got an organization in Whitesburg called Kane that uh, is processing local products and we've got local farms that are creating new recipes and new products that can be sold into different marketplace. And so the purpose of this is to bring community leaders, agriculture leaders, lenders, others that would be involved in helping grow agricultural opportunities in this region. No cost to attend, we would ask that you register. So if you'll see me after uh, 
during lunch, I'll give you a Kentucky Proud pin, and I'll also give you some information on the program. But we'd love to have you attend, uh, be, like I said, on the 18th of June, back down here at the Kentucky River Air Development Conference Room. It's not at their main office, but it's its conference room, so it's off-site. And then the other is uh, we partner with the World Trade Center of Kentucky on a number of activities. Uh, my role is senior trade advisor, so uh, I've been with the department three years in agriculture my whole life, but we're trying to grow opportunities globally. 95% of the population is outside of the United States, and so we feel like there's lots of opportunities to further add value to products that are grown here. World Trade Center is doing an e-commerce summit in September 10th in Louisville, and so I know they would uh, be glad for you to uh, register for that. There is a charge for their program. Uh, I'm not sure the registration fee. The land is, is free as long as you register, but uh, look forward to visiting with you over lunch and hearing some things that, that you all see going on in this area of the state. Thank you, Tim. Uh, they're also Kentucky Proud, and uh, Tim's team are our uh, lunch sponsor each year at our summit. Started last year, helped us make sure we had local foods to to feed, you know, a little over a thousand people, about twelve hundred people last year, and we're working on that again this year for our summit in September. Just a couple of days before that one, the fifth and sixth. Uh, so we appreciate your all's continued partnership. Um, so let's move on and talk about. Uh, Healthcare and connectivity, and how it's impacted a, a local hospital in in Manchester. And uh, so we have Jamie Couch, the AVP of Administration at Advent Health Manchester. Got it. Thank you, Jerry. Appreciate it. I'm in a dilemma. Uh, Tim mentioned lunch, and I'm the only thing standing between you and barbecue. <laughs> so, and I'm also going to talk about something I'm extremely passionate about, and that's uh, taking healthcare to. Um, our communities uh, and, and the challenges uh, that that uh, that encounters. So, first, a little bit about who Advent Health is. Um, oh, that's too quick. There we go. So we've got 50 hospitals around the country. Um, pretty large uh, system um, in nine states and 80,000 employees. We're the second or third smallest hospital in our system which gives us a lot of opportunity and leverage to be able to, to leverage some of the resources that our, uh, our mothership uh, 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 shares. And they've invested a lot of money in the region. Um, we, we're getting ready to install a, about a $16 million surgery center and our Advent Health corporate offices are, are uh, f uh, footing the capital for that. And so we're really excited to be able to serve uh, here in Eastern Kentucky and continue to expand here and serve more. A little bit about telemedicine and some of the uh, practical applications and challenges that we've encountered as uh, as we've uh, as we've uh, dove into the the swamp of telemedicine, trying to navigate the challenges that are there. Um, uh, and, and Advent Health, uh, little old Manchester, leads the corporation in in innovation uh, around telemedicine. Frankly, because of we have to. Uh, rural health care, there's a lot of challenges with transportation, a lot of challenges. You know this. We're, we are singing the same song here. Um, and also specialists. Getting highly specialized care to little old Manchester is hard. Recruiting is tough. So um, leveraging telemedicine became imperative uh, as we begin to try to uh, improve outcomes. Uh, CMS, uh, essentially any payer is driving uh, quality for payment versus payment per click, which is a good, it's really good, but it, it, it's hard to have quality without access. And so we've had to really focus on that. A few of the challenges, uh, really quick before I get into the practical applications, and I'm gonna to try to stick to five, Jared, I promise. Um, cost, it's expensive to do telemedicine. If, if you go to the big vendors, I mean, you're gonna pay $30,000 for one unit. Thank God for that. folks like the ARC, uh, 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 folks that have sponsored uh, different grants for us to be able to test and try. Um, and thankful for Advent Health uh, to have a pretty advanced IT group. So we bought a, we bought a unit uh, for around $30,000, which is a lot for us. And um, our local IT guys uh, built the same unit for a third of the cost and uh, was able to reconstruct it and make it economical for us to do. So that was the first hurdle. Second hurdle was uh, regulatory. Uh, in Senate Bill 112, 
uh, if, if, those, if there's those in the room that supported that, thank you. Uh, Senate Bill 112 is going to open the, 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 the gateway to provide uh, uh, an increased amount of telemedicine to our, our, our communities. And so uh, on the screen here, you see Telemat. Uh, his name is Matt White. He's our telemedicine coordinator. He works with Sean Neese here at uh, uh, a lot, which is the coordinator of telemedicine services, doing great work. And so Sean and Matt work really close with some of the students uh, from, from uh, this, this college. And um, it's been exciting to go down that journey. But Matt White, we've changed his name to Telemat because he, he essentially owns telemedicine uh, at Manchester, does a lot of work around it. This is one of our patients and one of our pediatricians, or one of our pediatric providers actually providing care uh, via telemedicine as we um, uh, went down the journey. So, so just a little bit about, this is just a few applications I'll share with you today. First is neurology. For Manchester to recruit a neurologist to, go to, to come and be in physically in our small town is tough. It's, it, the demand, we might demand 0.1 FTE, and it's hard to recruit somebody to say, we're going to pay you 0.1 because that's what we need, and so it's tough. But we've been able to partner with the University of Kentucky to, uh, to, to, to keep our patients home in their home clinic. So with neurology and memory disorder, uh, grandma gets to go to the same clinic she goes to on a normal basis and see a highly specialized neurologist at the University of Kentucky and, and smile on her way out as she drives five minutes down the road back, back home. We've, been, we've seen patients receive care, uh, memory disorder care, different neurology <laughs> services that would have never driven to Lexington. And so that's, uh, that's a, a, a huge a win for us. Another, uh, that's incoming care. I wanna talk a little bit about outgoing services really quick and then I'll bounce back over to, uh, to another incoming service. So what are, we, what are we sending out? So our goal is to export. <laughs> versus just import everything that's going on. So how do we export? One of the things we've done here in Clay County, um, the detention center, I don't know if anybody here is involved in correctional medicine and correctional health care, it's expensive uh, to provide that, especially if there's services out of the state that are coming in and, and they're really expensive, especially for a small, small uh, detention centers. And so we've um, worked with Clay County Detention Center to provide 24-7 telemedicine access to care, so our nurse practitioners and physicians are able to take a laptop home with a pair of Dr. Dre Beats. No, it's not Dr. Dre Beats uh, headset, but it's, just, it's something similar to that uh, that they take home, and uh, they're able to see an inmate at night. What that does for the jail, what that does for a jail on a tight budget, in a county on a tight budget, is this. Is it, they don't gotta pay for unnecessary ER visits. They don't gotta pay for two guards or in a third guard to come in and, 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 and be on the floor while the other two transport the person to the ER who didn't really need to go to the ER, and the ER visit. So we're saving a lot of money for our local uh, jail there and, and also creating a, a job uh, for a nurse practitioner to be able to, 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 to provide at home remote. So that's been a very unique um, opportunity, and we, we saw some wins there from that as well. The next one is nursing homes. Uh, in healthcare, Readmissions is a heavy hit. Uh, CMS will not pay uh, a, a, a healthcare facility for a readmit within so many days. So if you're discharged from the hospital, if you come back, uh, they're not gonna pay you, you gotta eat it. And that's hard, that's a big hit on healthcare. So we gotta focus on outcomes. So nursing homes are heavy readmitters. Um, so, but, but to provide better care to folks in nursing homes, We've also provided 24-7 services uh, to nursing homes to prevent the nursing homes from having the expense of transporting a patient and bringing in a new nurse. And it's elevated the level of care they receive. Now, Dr. Cornett, um, uh, which is our nursing home lead, uh, she's taking calls from nurses and they're saying, well, the, the rash is about, about the size of a quarter, it's about the color, about this color, and she's trying to make medical decisions over a telephone, and that's just not good medicine. She says, go to the ER, be admitted. Health, cost of health care goes up. So what do we do here? She opens her laptop, you get a dermatology camera and, and a stethoscope that she can hear and feel the heartbeat in her hand. It's, it's a beautiful thing. She provides the care, makes a good sound clinical medical decision, and you save that ER visit and that transport. So that's been a win for us as well. Uh, another one is high-risk OB. Um, we've got a lot of high-risk pregnancies in, in Clay County and Manchester, and um, it's been a, um, uh, a challenge for us. Uh, 
And so we've connected with University of Kentucky again here uh, to, um, to, pro to provide live uh, high-risk ultrasounds with a high-risk OB doc in Lexington, uh, which we couldn't recruit to Manchester. Uh, and so that's a, a really beautiful thing for us. There's a lot of other things I would love to talk about right now. Uh, one other I'll mention, though, <laughs> Jared. Um, another advantage uh, with telemedicine uh, in Eastern Kentucky and us expanding the, uh, the, these services is that we have the opportunity for, for um, a few of the things. One is remote patient monitoring. Uh, right now, when you're discharged from the hospital, we call you, we go to your house, we visit you, we try our best to be with you. There's remote patient monitoring systems uh, uh, with uh, watches and different things that we could, if it's connected to the internet, we could have someone sitting in anywhere in Eastern Kentucky getting notifications that Mrs. Jones is not taking your medication today because this, is, this level is up or this level is down. There's, that technology exists today with the proper bandwidth and the, expanding that bandwidth, we could provide extremely detailed care uh, very efficiently. And so I'm excited about that potential as well. Another one is just e-care apps. There's tons of apps out there right now. But guess what? If I'm at my mom's house, which is in a holler in Leslie County, guess what? I can't, I can't do the app because it just, the speed's not enough. It's granular and the sound's not well. Um, but if we get that improved, we're going we're gonna to be able to expand primary care, decrease the cost of health care, and improve outcomes. And so I'm excited about that. Another one. Uh, Manchester, I think I'm over, uh, but uh, in Manchester, <laughs> we've, we've been able to connect with um, our, our health system. In, in, in Orlando, Florida, we have 128 uh, around that uh, radiologist, some of them highly, highly specialized. You don't, get high, you don't get specialized radiology in Manchester, not 128 of them especially. So, so today we're able to, to, to have those le that level of care that they're getting in Orlando here. Um, at, that we couldn't get otherwise. Now, with that being said, I would like to flip that script. I would like to have the 128 sitting here providing the services to the, to the whole country. And so there's a way to do that. And, and, and so thanks for the effort around expanding and all the work and thought and you being here to be a part of this to help expand and really improve outcomes for our region. Awesome. Thank you. Let, we got time for one question. If anybody's brave enough to make people wait on barbecue another five minutes. Anybody got any questions? The, this whole panel will be around during lunch. Uh, I got a feeling the most important things are going to happen today around lunch. You go find the people that are in the room that you need to talk to, um, get some work done. Um, and uh, I think this is, we've painted the picture this morning. I hope that you see the potential with connectivity, uh, how we are leveraging what we've got right now. You know, while we uh, are going to talk in a minute and address the fact that we still have uh, we still have communities that aren't being served adequately with broadband, and we're going to talk about how we get there. Uh, what we wanted to understand this morning is it's critically important, like to the point that I don't know that there will be a long-term future in these some of these rural communities without connectivity. I can't promise that, but I can promise if they are connected. The opportunity and transformation just increases exponentially. So I believe we've got a duty to come together as a region and figure out how do we continue to build out, expand broadband. I'm going to ask anybody in here that works for uh, a telco or a local internet company, broadband company, uh, won't you all stand up? We've got several of those in here this morning. Or you've worked for them or you do work for them. Um, give them a big hand. I remember when we first, when I first started at SOAR and I was talking about internet, many of them came to me and said, we've been talking about that for 20 years. We've been doing this for 20 years. Um, but what I've hoped that SOAR has been able to do is move that conversation out of just the providers across all the sectors and build a momentum and understand uh, that we appreciate the work and investment that's been done to date because we're making transformation with what we've got and uh, we've not been able to track it specifically but I know my own internet service provider uh, in the last five years uh, they have faster packages and they're cheaper than they were five years ago and I would venture to say any of the providers in this room would probably say they've done the same they they're doing their part 
uh, to move the uh, move the solution forward. That's the last thing I'm going to say. Uh, and we're going to eat lunch. Uh, so enjoy some barbecue. I think it's set up in the back. Is Laura in here? Any specific directions for lunch? Help yourself. We'll reconvene uh, around 12:30. If we're going long on lunch, we'll we got uh, some extra time built in. But around 12:30, we'll reconvene, uh, reconvene with Kentucky Wired update, and we'll talk about the infrastructure side this afternoon. Thank you, guys.